This is an interview that I did with Pete Finney. Pete's a great steel guitar player, and he's played with some really cool and amazing artists over the years. But I asked him if he would be nice enough to share some stories about the time he spent playing with Doug Somm, and he was very generous with that. We recorded this over at Pete's house in East Nashville. My roommate Frankie might make a run in from time to time. He's a big Doug Somm fan, and he loves hearing the stories. But sit back and enjoy Pete Finney sharing stories about Doug Somm. I went to see Doug Somm play at the Cellar Door, which is a fairly famous showcase club in D.C. where a lot of people got starts. Or it's, I mean, Miles Davis recorded live albums there and Peter, Paul, and Mary. I mean, it was a real diverse. It was very much like the bottom line in New York. It was a, a showcase club. And Doug Somm was playing there one night. Went down to see him, and he had a bunch of friends of mine from D.C. playing that he had picked up. I didn't realize he was, he never had like huge success and he was sort of hand to mouth. He had great musicians in San Antonio and Texas that he played with his whole life on and off. But on this particular trip, he came to DC and hired some friends of mine to back him up. And I was like, wow, this is too cool. And that also gave me the opportunity to go back and say hi and meet him and introduce myself and all that. And he came back to play the same club six months or a year later. And somehow I knew he was bringing his, some of his Texas guys that went all the way back to his early hit records were coming with him, but he didn't have a steel guitar player. The cellar door was not the kind of place you could just show up and then go out to your car and bring a steel. And if they invited you to sit in, people were sitting very tightly in close tables and they'd paid what would have been a high cover charge at the time. And very, it was organized and they did a sound check in the afternoon. It was not like a local bar. It was like a small concert venue. I knew that that Doug was open to using local musicians, and I knew, and I'd made a little bit of a beachhead with him. You know, he'd probably recognize me if I walked up to him, and uh, I was trying to figure out a way to get in there and sit in with him. And the night before he was going to play, I ran into this guy at a party after whatever gig I had. So this guy said, well, I play with uh, Kinky Friedman, and we just travel as a duo, but his, his thing is he likes to get as many local musicians up on stage with him as he can for the finale. He said, does anybody here want to come play? And I light bulb went off my head. I just want to have my steel guitar in that club so I'll have a chance of playing with Doug Somm. And it worked. I went officially to play with Kinky Friedman, played one or two songs with Kinky that I never heard before. It was a total cluster. And I ended up... Doug said, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I've got my band here, but we're going to do a few songs where Steel would be great. Do you want to play? And I was like, yeah. And he, as I sort of thought he would, he called that song, Is Anybody Going to San Antonio? And I love the Steel parts on his record from that. And I knew every, I mean, Doug was not the kind of guy that would want you to play something note for note. He was the opposite of that. But I didn't know that. And I went in there and, and sat in and I played that song and I pretty much played it just like the record and felt and we played, and it was fun, and we hung out a little bit afterwards, and I went home, and that was that. And three or four days later, I got a call from Doug. He was in New York, and I wish I could imitate him, but if you he they leave little snippets of his talk on a lot of his record for good reason, because he talks really fast, and man, you got to come down, and man, it's just a stone groove, and just, man, it's really happening in New York. We had Dr. John play last night, and Paul Simon was here, and Johnny Winter's going to be here. You should come up and play. And I was like, okay. So I got a friend, and we drove to New York and double parked outside the Lone Star Cafe, and I carried my stuff in to – I don't know if anybody went to the old Lone Star Cafe in New York. It's pretty legendary, but it was a older restaurant building. It had a revolving door, and I had a, you know 80-pound steel guitar in one hand, 40-pound amp in the other. My car double parked with my friend in it outside, and – uh it's like eight o'clock at night, the night of the show. And I walk in, I go through the revolving door and I get, which is hard enough. And I get to the other side and it is just wall to wall, assholes and elbows, people waiting for Doug to come on. Somehow I got my stuff up to the stage, ran and saw Doug. who was probably surprised to see me. He said, you should come up, but I bet he forgot about it as soon as that. He's like, oh yeah, man. He had all, he had a big Texas band. He had his horn players. He had Rocky Morales, some really legendary players. That, great, great players play with Doug on and off. So I, I played with Doug that night, and it was great. And there's horns there, and there's Johnny Winter out in the audience, and there's somebody else that I'd never played in New York before. I'd just been playing D.C. bars, and this was, like, huge. And again, I didn't really think it was going to go anywhere. And at the end of the night, Doug came up and said, man, that was a stone groove, and that was great. And he said, if you want to come to Austin, you got a gig. Come on down. And that was exactly what I wanted to hear. 
I drove from Washington, D.C. to Austin on the strength of a... I already knew the guy. I was... I love him to death, but, you know, flaky and a stoner in his own little world. <laughs> on the strength of him saying, you come down, man. If you come to Austin, you got a gig. And I drove down... <laughs> I didn't like I didn't like sell I didn't move out of my house or anything but I drove down with my steel and and I looked and he, Doug had a thing he was ba- based in Austin originally from San Antonio but based in Austin for years and a big cornerstone of the whole Austin scene he was sort of the rock pillar and Willie Nelson in the early days early seventies and Willie was the sort of country pillar and they sort of overlapped a lot but um, Doug had been, he's sort of famously, I found out later it's because he probably owed people money or people were tired of him mooching or I don't know, whatever. <laughs> it, was, it sounds horrible. Um, he would periodically pick up and go to Vancouver for a month or go hang out in uh, Scandinavia for a month or two where he had, you know, still had like hit records or he would just kind of disappear and go somewhere else. So I got to Austin and the local paper, the Austin American Statesman, above mm. the title of the paper like whatever you call the thing that runs above the top it said sir doug returns you know four nights at soap creek saloon i was like damn so we played the original soap creek saloon was a smaller bar in the south of austin i just missed it by a month or two it was a legendary place it was a dirt road much of the legendary stuff that comes from austin music lore in the 70s is from the soap creek saloon doug lived right there I missed that. That place had gotten closed. They had taken over a place that had been the Skyline Club, which was a big sort of rambling wooden fire trap dance hall. It was very much like the Broken Spoke that's still there in Austin today. It was that kind of place. And it was the last place Hank Williams ever played before he died. A year or two later, it was the last place Johnny Horton ever played before he died. It's sort of a fluke. But it had a long history as a country bar, probably the place that hippies wouldn't go at the time. They also had a picture of Doug Somm, who had been a child prodigy country star there was a full-scale eight by ten publicity photo of little doug on sarge records and he had an old fender steel guitar and a fiddle and a guitar and that was that was there from when it was a country bar anyway now the coolest sort of rock blue i mean stevie ray vaughn was an unknown he played there delbert mcclinton first week there with doug i was a totally unknown in the new city marsha ball opened for us the first night the t-birds opened for us the second night Alvin Crow opened for us the third night, and I forget who opened for us the fourth night. And so for me, it was just like the perfect introduction. Just, I mean, I was on top of the world. I was like getting introduced to this Austin scene. You walked into Austin through the front door. I did. I, I mean, inst- talk about instant credibility because everybody loved Doug. From the, Everybody in the country world knew him. Everybody in the blues world knew him. And he was just universally loved and respected. So, yeah, it was just an amazing week. Oh, the, this started with, I, they they told me, well, we're going to all get together and rehearse. we get the horn players. We're going to be there, you know, Thursday at 4 o'clock, you know, because I told them I was coming at some point. And I went there Thursday, 4 o'clock, nobody there, 5 o'clock, nobody there, 6 o'clock, nobody there, 7 o'clock, nobody there. <laughs> and I was like, what's going on here? It's like, that was, that, was, that was all I needed to know about the nature of that gig. But when I played, it was great. Doug could very easily have gone back, and I'm sure when he said, "Hey, come to Austin, you got a gig," he could. But things were loose enough. If Doug had a gig at that point, he would book a gig and sort of tell everybody. And different, he must have made sure there was a bass player and a drummer there. Somebody had to have done some organizing. But on any given night, it might be a horn section and me because I was there. I had nothing else to do. I was like, I'm coming to every gig. I didn't realize that other people would sort of come and go depending on what else they had. It was sort of a, a floating collective of Doug Song musicians, but some really amazing musicians. Jack Barber, who'd been the original quintet, played bass a lot. Augie Myers was not around, and he had his own band in, in San Antonio, and I don't know if they'd had a falling out. They would later reunite in many different ways, but at the time, he was not there. The other, Augie being the keyboard player, was sort of defined the Sir Douglas sound. So it was a really, really exciting time for me, just thrown in the deep end of the Austin scene. Were you making money at these gigs? Actually, yeah, Doug was very fair. Like those gigs, um, he was very fair about the money. I think they just counted it all up. And if there were eight musicians, he'd make nine piles and take two and then pay everybody else. And that's perfectly fair. And he was honest about it. And he was cool. If there was money from the gig... He would pay everybody well, and I made more on those than I'd ever made anywhere else. And this was in Austin in a club, and famously, you don't make money in Austin clubs. But if you're Sir Doug in this year, 
I later found out we would go on the road. We did some short trips here and there. That's there were places where he maybe had canceled a gig and had already taken the advance and he was going to the gig knowing that they weren't going to have any money to pay him. And then there would be some fast talking and some excuses and we'll talk to you next week. And so there was some kind of shady stuff, but it grew out of just the looseness and the, I mean, I have to say, I mean, everything about this whole era and Doug is just, he was not into hard drugs. I don't think he, he ate cocaine. He didn't drink much, if at all. The guy was famous for smoking a lot of weed. That's part of his <laughs> not betraying any confidence. <laughs> that was part of who he was. And you hear him, they're just like these, he's naturally speedy. He's just a fast talking sort of adrenaline. And he, and this is the first time I'd ever seen this in my life. But if he had two joints, he'd give you one. No questions asked. But if he just had one, he might smoke the whole thing and you'd be standing there and he wouldn't hand it to you. <laughs> I've never seen that in my life. Part of that whole sort of fast talking stoner thing, he was pretty self-absorbed it wasn't like ego or whatever but it was just whatever he was into in that moment is what he was into and that's what he was going to talk about and he wasn't necessarily curious about what you did that day or where you came from or what's your things sort of revolved around Doug and it was all he he was definitely one of the most unique and charismatic characters having said all this about how exciting the first period with Doug was and what a great introduction it was to everything. And that's all true. I also soon learned that just like the fact that he'd been gone from Austin for a month or two before I got there, I had a friend back in DC who, who booked shows and booked shows up and down the East coast and club shows and cool music and stuff. And he wanted to book a Doug Psalm, you know, Doug would come up and do the nicer, club and small concert venues and do fairly well this guy was like an independent booking so he was calling some of these places and trying to book doug and he was getting a lot of well i'm not sure he's kind of unreliable and so my friend booked this he kind of had to almost guarantee like swear on him yes doug's going to be there and my experience with doug was i only saw him when he was there so i hadn't maybe learned about the times when he was booked and just didn't show up so it turned out i found out there were two factors to this so my friend booked a tour that was going to include either Lone Star Cafe or the bottom line and the cellar door again, and probably one or two colleges and just an East coast, maybe eight or 10 day run. And our first two shows were in St. Louis and then Springfield, Missouri. And there's two big things here. This is not that relevant. Doug's a huge, huge baseball fan. He would talk about baseball for hours at a time, which I don't, don't relate to it i don't know it I enjoy a game now and then but can't go there so we were in st louis they made a point and we stayed an extra day they booked it so we could go to a cardinals game or whatever we went back from st louis which was our first game we played whiskey whiskey something it was it was the really nice club there we had a great show i thought man it's gonna be fun tour we're out playing we're headed to my home turf it's great it's like my version of the big time I, you know showbiz big time but was music that I loved my whole life. I still loved it. I was in the middle of it. This is great. We went back to Springfield, Missouri, and I forget the name of the club. It was really cool, small, kind of hippie-ish sort of roots music club. And they put us up at a house there. There was some people that had a big house that was and a guy showed up there. This is I'd never seen this before, but a guy showed up but I don't know the names and it's so far away. I don't I don't feel bad about mentioning this stuff he showed up with this you know halliburton attache case opened it up and it was first time i'd ever seen it there were sealed bags of really pretty marijuana buds like what we call sensimia nowadays but or just what everybody takes for granted if you smoke weed and this guy was the first scientific dope grower i'd ever run into and he had a big secret field he actually ended up taking this out there outside of Springfield and he brought that to the gig and Doug ended up canceling the next gig we had wherever it was. I don't know. It was back somewhere on the way to Washington, DC. So let's just stay here for a couple of days. And I thought it was just cause we were having so much fun and party. And the other thing, I don't know if you know, soup Granda, you probably do the bass player for the Ozark mountain daredevils. Oh. This was their home base. We met all of them. Soup and I joke about it to this day. They were all friends. So we got there and we ended up booking just like the club it was like, you want to play another night? Sure. And it was so loose and so awesome. And so whatever. But I was freaking out because my friend had, 
personally guaranteed that we were going to show up for all these gigs and Doug had already canceled the first one. I'm not, I don't know what the excuse he gave. <laughs> and I thought it was just because he wanted to party. And then it was like, he ended up canceling another gig and we're like, just going to stay here and party. And they drove back to St. Louis, went to another ball game and came back and I was starting to get nervous. It's like, at the time I thought it was just that he was so in the moment and so wanting to have a good time and he just wanted to party and it was worth blowing up. And it also meant we weren't going to make any money on these gigs I was hoping to do. I was starting to get nervous. We ended up staying there. He ended up canceling the whole tour back east little by little. And I, this is nuts and it's kind of fun. But I was like, what have I got myself into here? And it's not like I had, I didn't have, I, I hadn't decided that now I found this gig and it's going to make me a star. I'm going to, be rather this is fun i'm just riding the train we'll see how how long it'll go it was very disappointing and i was caught in the middle with my friend and booked the shows and this is what i came to find out and i i'll let you decide what this is this starts to be smirch doug a little bit um like i said he was always honest with the money if there was money there to gig he paid it to everybody he didn't like skim it off the top and pretend there wasn't any and give you a 100 bucks or whatever and i witnessed that at the very beginning what I found out was because he was so unreliable and also because he probably bought big bags of weed or whatever in advance, it turned out a lot of these gigs we were getting ready to do, there wasn't going to be any money there. They were makeup gigs for shows he'd already canceled and maybe kept the advance or whatever. So he was probably scared he was going to get up there and unless we made a whole lot more money at the door or whatever, he wasn't going to be, he was going to have a whole band of people 800,000, 1,200 miles from home and not be able to pay him. So I think that was a large part. I ended up taking a Greyhound bus. I'd had enough of that. I was kind of stranded. You know, no income. I was kind of tired of the party and starting to wonder what was going on. Many years later, I didn't stay in touch with Doug. We didn't like to call each other up or what an email or anything like that. But I would look him up if I was around and see him every year or two. And it's always very friendly. I'm not sure I played with him after I, I moved here. Doug called a friend of mine. That we'd all been hanging out with him. He didn't call me, but he called a friend of mine and said, man, I could really feel all the beautiful vibrations of love in Nashville. And we've laughed about that ever since. <laughs> and Doug had this, he was a one of a kind. He was a, he's definitely missed. That was Pete Finney talking about the time that he spent playing with Doug Som. Thank you guys very much for listening to this. And, I appreciate you guys spreading the word with your friends and uh, turning them on to the show. Hit that like button, share it, and I will see you somewhere down the road.